you know, God's been on trial since the first century. <laughs> Jesus was on trial and uh, was killed on Good Friday by Jews, and he's still on trial today. Hey guys, welcome to the show. I hope you had a happy Easter. I did here in Los Angeles and uh, he is risen. He is risen indeed. And uh, I just want to talk of today about an article that was published in the New York Times, an op-ed piece uh, last week, basically bashing God. And the New York Times does this every year <laughs> to try to sow doubt among Christians, really. And But before I get into that, I just want to Thank you guys. On Monday, we hit 50,000 subscribers, which is amazing. Praise God. Because, you know, when I first started the show, I wanted to expose the lies of the culture and bring the biblical truth to bear on those lies. Because I lived in those lies for so many years. I lived in the dark for so long. And I lived as, you know, as you know, a gay man in Hollywood for so many, many years. And so, I'm just so glad that God is using this channel and blessing this channel uh, because I really, this channel was really for, it's really for the church. It's really for Christians to help Christians kind of see the, the blind spots of the culture and to see what the culture is doing and how the culture is, is constantly lying to us. And, and I want to use God's word and the truth to, to kind of expose those lies. And so I really appreciate your support. I appreciate your subscriptions. And, um, so thank you so much for that. It's a milestone 50,000. That's, that's pretty amazing. Praise God. So, and God gets all the glory for that. It's not me. So, uh, it's, I'm going to talk about this article in the New York times, but the very first episode I did on this show was was an article written right before Easter in the New York Times several years ago. And you can go check that episode out. We'll put a link to it. But uh, the episode is called, Can, Can We Really Know God Exists? And it was based on an, a, an op-ed piece in the New York Times. And the title of the op-ed piece was, God is a question, comma, not an answer. So you can go look at that. But the New York Times loves to just uh, bash God every year. Well, not every day, really, but every year for sure before Easter. And this is no exception. And this, this article, the title of the article is, In this time of war, I propose we give up God. This is by Shalom Auslander. He's Jewish. And he says, basically, he's saying in this time of war with Ukraine and the Ukrainian and Russian war, we should give up God. And here's what he says. Uh, and it's funny because a lot of you sent me this article to talk about this article. And I already, I already had it earmarked to talk about it. And so I got a lot of messages from you guys uh, about this article. And uh, so I'm, I'm happy to, to address it today. And I want to look at what Shalom Auslander says in the article and then what the biblical truth is behind this lie. So he says, he starts the article this weekend, and he's talking about Passover. He says, this weekend, Jews around the world will celebrate the holiday of Passover, the name of which comes from the story of God passing over the homes of our distant ancestors on his way to slaughter the firstborn sons of evil Egyptians. Our forefathers, the story goes, marked their doorposts, doorpost with lamb's blood in order to spare their own sons the awful fate of their enemies. And then he says, in this time of war and violence, of oppression and suffering, I propose we pass over something else, God. So he's saying we should cancel God. We should pass over God because God is a, a monster, according to him. And even though he saved his people 
out of bondage in Egypt. God is a monster. So anyway, he goes on to say, Two aspects of the Passover story have troubled me since I was first taught them long ago in an Orthodox yeshiva in New York. Yeshiva is a is an Orthodox Jewish school in, in New York when I was eight years old. And as the holiday approached, our rabbi commanded us to open our Old Testaments to the book of Exodus. To get us in the holiday spirit, he told us gruesome tales of torture and persecution. The Egyptians, he told us, used the corpses of Jewish slaves in their buildings. Um, now, that's a crazy assertion. <laughs> it doesn't even make any sense. I don't know who this rabbi is, but he's clearly bonkers. There's no way you could use a corpse in a, build to, in a building because the corpse decomposes and the building would collapse. So, uh, And then, so he goes on to say, he said, he asked the rabbi, you mean they use slaves to build their buildings and the slaves died from work? No, said the rabbi. They put Jewish bodies in the walls and use them as bricks. So clearly this, this Orthodox yeshiva in New York is just teaching crazy things to these, uh, these poor Jewish kids. And he says, uh, my father was something of a handyman at the time. And this seemed to me a serious violation of basic building codes, not to mention a surefire way to, to lose a home sale. Is this brick? The interested couple asked. No, no, says the realtor. That's corpse. That's borscht belt humor, if you don't know. <laughs> and so he says, but just as troubling, even more so today in light of the brutal slaughter taking place in Ukraine, were the plagues themselves. God, the rabbi said, struck all the Egyptians with his wrath, not just Pharaoh and his soldiers. Egyptians, young and old, innocent and guilty. By the way, everyone's guilty. Not, there's no innocent. Uh, we'll, we'll get to that in a minute. But Egyptians, young and old, innocent and guilty, suffered locusts and frogs, hail and darkness, beasts running wild and water becoming blood. Mothers nursing their babies, the rabbi explained, found their breast milk had turned to blood. Again, this rabbi is is insane. Uh, that is nowhere in the Bible that their breast milk turned to blood. Um, so uh, again, he's just getting just crazy false teaching. And the, it goes on to say, but Pharaoh, the story continues, still wouldn't relinquish his slaves. Technically, this was God's fault as he, quote, hardened Pharaoh's heart, unquote. But the issue of free will wouldn't begin troubling me until my teens. And so God, in his mercy, started killing babies. And then he quotes Exodus eleven five. He says, Every firstborn son in the land of Egypt shall die, from the firstborn of Pharaoh who sits on the throne to the firstborn of the servant girl. And then he says, Surely I wondered there were some Egyptians who didn't whip Jews, who didn't have anything against Jews at all. Surely there were... Egyptians horrified by slavery, Egyptians who disagreed with Pharaoh as often as we do with our own leaders. Everyone, I asked the rabbi. He struck everyone? Everyone, the rabbi said. And he goes on to say, God, it seems, paints with a wide brush. He paints with a roller. In Egypt, said our rabbi, he even killed first, firstborn cattle. He killed cows. If he were mortal, the God of Jews, Christians, and Muslims would be dragged to the Hague. The Hague is the International Criminal Court in the Netherlands. So basically, he's saying God should be dragged into criminal court. Um, you know, God's been on trial since the first century. <laughs> Jesus was on trial and uh, was killed on Good Friday by Jews, and he's still on trial today. And so this is nothing new. This has been going on for two millennia. And so he, and again, he says, if, if God were mortal, the, the God of Jews, Christians, and Muslims. Now that's, that's side note. The God of Jews, Christians, and Muslims is not the same God. Um, the God of Christians and Muslims is not the same God. We do not worship the same God and they deny that Jesus is, is, is God. So, and Jews deny that Jesus is God. So how can we worship the same God? If someone worships the true God, they would worship Jesus because he is the same. He is of the same nature of the one true God. 
And so even Jesus says this in John, in the Gospel of John, chapter 8. Jesus said, he's talking to the Jews, and he says, Jesus said to them, If God were your father, you would love me, for I came from God and I am here. I came not on my own accord, but he sent me. Why do you not understand what I say? Is it because you cannot bear to hear my word? You are of your father the devil, and your will is to do your father's desires. He was a murderer from the beginning and, and does not stand in the truth because there is no truth in him. And so he goes on. But, but basically, yeah, we, we can't, we don't worship the same God as Jews and Muslims because they don't believe Jesus is God. And they and we they would in in order for them to worship the same God they would have to worship Jesus because Jesus is God and Jesus is the mediator between God and man between God the Father and and us Jesus is the mediator there's no way to God except through Jesus Jesus said I am the door I am the way the truth and the life no one comes to the Father except through me so Jesus is the only way to the Father. So there's no way to worship God unless you go through Jesus. Um, so that's just that's just a another another theological mistake that this guy is this writer is making. Oh, and also in First John chapter two, uh, John the apostle says, "No one who denies the Son has the Father. Whoever confesses the Son has the Father also." So Jews and Muslims deny the Son. And, and John says, no one who denies the Son has the Father. So you can't have the Father without the Son. Again, there's no way to, to the Father with, uh, without going through Jesus, without going through Christ. He's the mediator. So he says basically that God should be dragged to the Hague and tried in criminal court. And he says, and yet we praise him. We emulate him. We implore our children to be like him. And he says, perhaps now as missiles rain down and the dead are discovered in mass graves is a good time to stop emulating this hateful God. Perhaps we can stop extolling his brutality. Perhaps now is a good time to teach our children to pass over God, to be as unlike him as possible. And he goes on to, to give illustrations of how rabbis, priests, and imams should be teaching in their classrooms. And he gives this example, and so God killed them all. That was wrong, children. And then he says, God threw Adam out of Eden for eating an apple. By the way, we no one knows it's an apple. It could be a mango. It just says fruit. It could be it could be anything. Um, but he says, God threw Adam out of Eden for eating an apple. That's called being heavy-handed, children. Cursing all women for eternity because of Eve's choices? That's called collective punishment, children. Don't do that. So this man thinks that this the writer of this article, obviously he's in the dark. He doesn't know God, and he thinks that he knows better than God. And we're going to get to, to that in a minute. But because obviously he didn't read the book of Job in his, uh, his yeshiva, because in the book of Job, in chapters 38 and 39, God excoriates Job for protesting. And God sa says to Job, he asked Job, where were you when I laid the foundation of the earth? Tell me if you have understanding. Who determined its measurements? Surely you know. Or who stretched the line upon it? And he goes on and on and on for two chapters, just uh, railing against Job. Because, again... And it reminds me of the proverb, Proverbs 3. Trust in the Lord with all your heart and do not lean on your own understanding. So we have to trust that God knows. Humans have finite wisdom. finite. Uh, we're, we have finite minds. And God is infinite. And he has, in, his inf in his infinite wisdom, he knows what is best. And, and by the way, this idea that I'll go back to this idea that Egyptians, some of the Egyptians were innocent. We know that that's not true. We know from, from the Old Testament and the New that 
every human being is guilty before God. We are all rebels against God. We are all sinful. We're not only born in sin, we're conceived in sin. And in Psalm 14, it says, The fool says in his heart, there is no God. They are corrupt. They do abominable deeds. There is none who does good. The Lord looks down from heaven on the children of man to see if there are any who understand, who seek after, after God. They have all turned aside. Together they have become corrupt. There is none who does good, not even one. Psalm 53, again, repeats this. It reiterates this. The fool says in his heart, there is no God. They are corrupt, doing abominable iniquity. There is none who does good. God looks down from heaven on the children of man to see if there are any who understand, who seek after God. They have all fallen away. Together they have become corrupt. There is none who does good, not even one. So again, we all deserve the wrath of God. Every human deserves the wrath of God. Every human des deserves destruction and punishment from God. The fact that God deigned to save even one human being is a miracle. It's astonishing that God condescended into this world uh, through his son, Jesus Christ, to, to die on the cross, to rise again, to take on the penalty of our sin and take the death that we deserved to give us eternal life. That's, that's incredible mercy and grace. And the fact that God did that is, is, uh, is a miracle because again, we all deserve death. And then Paul in Romans chapter three, he reiterates this, uh, this idea from the old Testament. He says, he says, what, what then are we Jews better, any better off? No, not at all. For we have already charged that all both Jews and Greeks are under sin as it is written. None is righteous. No, not one. No one understands. No one seeks for God. All have turned aside. Together they have become worthless. No one does good, not even one. So again, this is this idea is repeated in the New Testament. And then Paul, in, in later in Romans chapter 3, he says, For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. Every human is, has, has sinned and, and fallen short of the glory of God. And that again, we all deserve the wrath of God. But in his mercy, he has chosen to save save some human beings. And so, and then Romans 6, he says the wage, wages of sin is death. And then finally, in Romans chapter 9, Paul is talking about God's sovereign choice and election. And he said, but this applies here. He says, you will say to me then, why does God still find fault? For who can resist his will? But who are you, O man, to answer back to God? Will what is molded say to its molder, why have you made me like this? Has the potter no right over the clay to make out of the same lump one vessel for honorable use and another for dishonorable use? What if God, desiring to show his wrath and to make known his power, has endured with much patience vessels of wrath prepared for destruction in order to make known the riches of his glory for vessels of mercy, which he has prepared before and for glory? Now notice that. He says, what if God desiring to show his wrath and to make known his power has endured with much patience vessels of wrath prepared for destruction? God, God pronounced judgment on um, Sodom and Gomorrah, on uh, the Canaanites. And, and again, this is God has, that's his prerogative. He created us and we rebelled against him. He has the right to judge us. And again, the fact that he has mercy on us through his son Jesus is amazing. This reminds me of, of the idea of Felix culpa, which means it's the Latin for happy fault. And this came from Augustine's writings. Uh, he, he wrote a treatise on Christian piety called Incaridion on faith, hope, and love. So Felix culpa, the argument of that has this idea that God decided or judged that it's better to bring good out of evil than not to permit any evil to exist. In other words, a world in which grace is experienced is a better world in, in which you would never experience grace. 
So again, this, this just brings God more glory. And that's what I was reading in, in Romans chapter nine. He was, he did this in order to make known the riches of his glory for vessels of mercy. So praise God that we are vessels of mercy. <laughs> I mean, I seriously, I wake up, I, I, I tell you this all the time, but I wake up every day and I'm just like, I can't believe that I'm in the kingdom of God. I can't believe that I know the truth. I think that I can't believe that God plucked me out of darkness in West Hollywood of all places, California, out of a homosexual life. God plucked me out of that darkness and pulled me into his marvelous light. And I mean, I'm just stunned every day about it. And I... I can't get enough of, of God's word and of the truth. I mean, every night I watch multiple sermons. <laughs> right now I'm on this Alistair Begg uh, jag and I watch like two to three of his sermons every night because it's just like I love the truth so much because again, I was in the dark for so long. For I was in the dark for 42 years. And so when you finally come into the light and you understand the truth and you know Christ and you know, and you're united to Christ and you, uh, you have eternal life, all you want to do is consume more and more of, of his truth and his word and, and be more and more intimate with, with Jesus in prayer and communion. And so, and with his people, uh, that's why the local church is so important can't stress that enough. Um, but yeah, I'm just, I'm just, I can't get over it. And I'm so glad, as I always say, I have all of eternity to thank God for his mercy. Uh, and that he just had, he had grace and mercy on me and all, and all of you. And by the way, if you, if you don't know Christ, if you don't have a relationship with Jesus. And if you have not been born again, I urge you to read God's word, to read the gospel of John, perhaps, and, and just cry out to God and say, God, I want to know you. I want to, I, I want to, uh, have a relationship with you and just keep knocking on that door. Jesus says, knock, and it will be open to you. Seek and you will find. And so just keep knocking, keep asking, and don't give up because it is so worth it. So I hope that helped uh, because these articles come out every, all the time, especially around Easter and Christmas, these kind of these articles in media and uh, in Time Magazine and Newsweek. There's always these kind of articles that that try to undermine the authority of Scripture, that try to undermine the veracity of of the gospel, the veracity of the resurrection. And so please ignore these articles. But I just wanted to just point this out because this is the kind of stuff that just causes Christians to doubt and it sows doubt and the culture is already sowing enough doubt as it is. So just ignore, ignore the culture and spend your time in this, in the word of God. So I hope that helped you guys. Thank you so much again for all the subscribers you guys are amazing and i will see you next week on the beckett cook show thanks